So without further ado, our keynote speaker is Lisa King. And I'm going to give you a bit of a background on Lisa. She is a senior policy planner for the City of Toronto's City Planning Division. As a sustainability practitioner for over 20 years in the public and private sectors, Lisa has worked to integrate sustainability principles into land use and strategic planning policy and processes. She specializes in the areas of sustainable design, climate change, energy, and resilience policy and standards. She has been central in the development and scaling up of the Toronto Green Standard, uh, tiered sustainable performance measures for new construction and Toronto's zero emissions buildings framework for which she was named to Canada's Clean 50 2018 for contributions to clean capitalism and the recipient of the Canada Green Building Council's Government Leadership Award. Wow, that's amazing. Th Congratulations, Lisa. <laughs> she completed her graduate work in environmental studies at Antioch University Midwest in Ohio uh, with a focus on policy and community planning and has an undergraduate degree from Western University in London, Ontario. Lisa, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill, uh, and welcome everybody. And I'm so happy to be here at your forum. I actually didn't know about it until Andrew invited me to speak here. And it uh, looks like a great uh, curriculum. Does everybody take the whole curriculum as part of what you do as well as attend the forum? Or is that a separate kind of thing? Yeah. Now, how many are studying planning in the room? Okay, that's amazing. And I think we have some environmental technology students, perhaps. Anybody else? Engineering? Yeah, civil or mechanical electrical? Okay. So I, I tried to customize this a little bit to uh, cater to what I think are your interests. Um, so my background has been well described there by Bill. Um, I've been at the city for about 13 years and before that I was in conservation authorities for quite a while. Um, and then I was also a private consultant uh, for some time too. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about is some different work that we're doing in our group, which is called Environmental Planning in the City of Toronto City Planning Division. Um, but let's just start, I know you've heard a lot about resilience, I'm sure, in the last few days, uh, but let's start with a really basic definition for me, is, you know, the ability for any system to recover after a shock or disruption. Um, it's the recovery that's key in that definition for me as a planner, thinking about that. And I like to think of it in short as safe to fail, safe to fail planning. So if you think about what that means for a minute, um, well, I'll let you think about it actually as we're going through the discussion this morning. Um, this is a, a graph that I like to use that's prepared by a company called Southern Harbour that's based in Toronto, who does some really great thinking work around sustainable infrastructure and resilient infrastructure. And the idea here is that you have a time continuum and we're all involved at different stages of that continuum in our work. Uh, but what happens when systems go down? And how quickly do we need to recover those systems, whether they're community social systems, whether they're physical infrastructure systems, to a minimum operating capacity or even better, a minimum sustainable operating capacity before you get back to your routine recovery? And during those recovery phases are when uh, you get particular impacts on a financial you know, sustainability of it's a company. It needs to recover very quickly after some kind of disruption. Um, so we want those systems to be able to recover quickly. And the way we have to make sure they do that is by thinking about capacity. So what's the capacity of the systems that we're designing? So whether social or physical. So resilience is operational, not assets. So I put that forward to you. I'm having a little trouble with my pointer. And it's the other half of sustainability. See if you agree with that. So sustainability is about mitigating environmental impacts and moving towards regenerative approaches. But Operational resilience is again about thinking about what the capacity of those systems or pieces of, of infrastructure are over time 
and designing for that as well. And sometimes as planners, we're only involved in that very first phase of design up and before a building or a piece of infrastructure even starts to get built. So this really requires us to start thinking about that sort of safe to fail emergency planning kind of concept, what's the capacity over time, given what we expect and anticipate. And another way to think about it in our role in, in land use planning is to be thinking about hazards and risks and vulnerabilities. So you probably heard a lot about that maybe with people talking about resilience too. So in a community or a neighborhood, what are all those vulnerabilities that exist in that neighborhood to begin with that when you overlay some kind of emergency or disruption, whether it's from climate, extreme weather, or something else, that causes them to have difficulty to recover more quickly. So we want to address those underlying, underpinning issues too. So for us in planning uh, in the City of Toronto, we think of climate resilient growth in this way, usually around these kind of topics areas. So natural heritage protection, biodiversity planning, stormwater management, which I think you're spending some time on, um, low carbon development, reducing urban heat island effect, and uh, reducing the impacts of extreme weather. And there are some principles too that we want to be thinking about in terms of planning principles. So designing for the human experience, like what I was just talking about, which really means what, how resilient or how healthy is that neighborhood, just like an ecosystem in the first place uh, for when these kind of disruptions occur. Thinking long-term, which has always been a sustainability principle, so that's something we have in common, um, being able to withstand and, and thrive in the face of climate change, building nature into the city is really key to us in terms of its resilience capacity that it adds, so the green infrastructure, taking leadership on climate change, of course, and government and the policies we create, and then systems thinking, which again has always been part of sustainability, but with a different kind of lens on that. These are some of the tools that we tend to use as planners that I'm sure you're learning lots about, and it's about how can we use those tools best to address these kinds of new problems that we have and the future projections that we have on weather and extremes too. And how we, can we combine our idea of strategies? And in Toronto, there's a whole bunch of new strategies coming out right now uh, with me mechanisms like regulation and incentive. And what do those mechanisms, what are the impacts that they have on things like market demand and change forces within the market economy that we want to see? And investment and financial disclosure that you heard that TD Insurance is involved in is a very key part of all that too. So you've kind of, some of these things that are shown here are some things that I'm going to talk about this morning, some of the key initiatives we have and tools, um, namely the Toronto Green Center I'm going to talk to you about and a bit about the Green Roof Bylaw uh, and Green Streets and things like that. So a few key facts as we kind of go through, walk through the talk this morning. Um, this is an interesting one, a fact that I read recently that between 2015 and 2050, which is the time period that the International Panel of Climate Change Scientists are asking the globe to become carbon neutral, we'll have built two tr trillion square feet. So constructed and renovated two trillion square feet um, globally, which is equivalent to creating one New York City from scratch every 35 days. So if you think about just that fact, and that was Bruce King, who's, who's not actually a relative of mine, um, author of The New Carbon Architecture, said that. Uh, if you think about that for a minute, um, how much are we building? Where are all those resources come from? What's the energy and carbon embodied in those materials? What's the GHG emissions being locked into that construction? So how are we possibly going to meet our targets? Why are we building so much? So here's Toronto in 2006 in terms of growth, so just a visual idea, way of looking at growth. Uh, this is, so take a good look at the skyline there, 2006. This is it in 2018. And right now we have 400,000 residential units coming through the pipeline to be built. And 11, I think it's 11 million square feet of non-residential development coming through. So, um, you could think of that in terms of, you know, it's about 1,200, 1,300 additional tall buildings, perhaps, that are coming forward just right now. So we've been in a big boom. We're the fourth largest city in North America. Um, that's a lot of materials. It's a lot of energy use. It's a lot of carbon. And this is our landscape. It's not the greatest picture of our landscape, but the idea that we're a city of ravines and watersheds. 
Uh, we have nine watersheds in the city of Toronto. We have the Oak Ridges Moraine at the top that's feeding water down into Lake Ontario through those systems. And there's a real impact on those systems when you have this level of development activity. And that's what you do as a planner, is you're trying to reduce that impact, you're reviewing and caring for those development applications, coaching uh, development and consulting teams through the process, and making sure you get the best quality of building and infrastructure through that process that you're part of. It's a really key and important role. So a few other stats. Now, when you think of the social side, we have quite a bit of disparity across the city of Toronto in terms of income, employment, and even growth and development in some ways, which you probably know quite a bit about already. Um, so those are just some of those underlying stressors that you think about um, when you're looking at resilience. And of course, our infrastructure itself is quite overburdened in terms of the population and the continuous population increase in pressures we have on sanitary storm infrastructure, on roads, um, and other services we provide. Could be daycares, uh, libraries, community centers, all those kind of things. So as a planner, you're trying to provide for and match the level of demand of servicing that's required, but in a sustainable and a resilient way. So here's the international panel last report in 2018, which I think everybody would be familiar with. But the idea here is that they, they issued a special report um, because things were progressing on a worse pathway than we thought. And that pathway um, is just showing us that we're overshooting on carbon to what we need to be, to be getting to and according to the climate agreements that we have. So to reach that 1.5 degrees C maximum increase in global temperature, we have to be much more aggressive in our actions and activities. So you can think about, you know, what role can you play in that going forward? So the city of Toronto recently declared a climate emergency along with many other cities around the world. Not sure if you heard of that, but so Meritori did that in October, early October. And what that even means for us is where we had already very aggressive climate action planning at the city of Toronto, we have to bump it up some more. So some of the things I'm gonna tell you, you'll probably be surprised and amazed at what Toronto is doing. So we have an 80% reduction by 2050 GHG citywide target already. We've, had, we've been a leader actually in uh, the, the cities around the world on climate action um, for a couple of decades. And I think you're hearing from David Miller this afternoon. Uh, and he was um, the mayor when I started out at the city actually. And out of his uh, lead leadership, we got a lot of the green programs that you're gonna be hearing about. But what you see in the modeling there, and um, I can't show you with the pointer, but you'll see that we hit our 2020 GHG citywide targets. That's great. But when we look out to 2050, there's a big gap. And that's the blue area shaded that you see on the screen. It's an 8.7 megaton per year gap in CO2 emissions to reach that 80% reduction target. Now what happens if, based on the climate emergency, we need to now even move that up further, be more aggressive, so maybe we want to be carbon neutral, and maybe we want to do that by 2040. Now, for me, when I, used to, when I talk about 2040, 2030, these kind of timelines, um, to me, they seem really far away. But 2030 is really basically 10 years away from now. So imagine having to, we need to really switch our mindset to how is everything going to be carbon neutral and climate, climate resilient that we're building and designing now, because it takes almost that long to build them and construct them and operate, start the operating part of those cycles. So the largest component here contributing is buildings. So the building sector component of our emissions portfolio comp composes about 52% uh, of our total emissions in Toronto. And um, then you can see transportation is next and waste. And that might seem counterintuitive because you can see and feel the emissions from vehicles on the road, you can feel that congestion. I certainly did this morning on the way here. From buildings, we don't see it. And where is it coming from? Well, again, about 50% of the building's emissions is coming from the use of natural gas as our fuel source. So this is where we've got to start thinking about fuel source emissions and switching. How are we gonna get our homes to switch off of this to very clean, low carbon fuel sources to address this? Um, what this graph is showing here is that uh, the quality of life versus our carbon emissions 
are not really lined up in the way that we would like. And we have to think about what our real objectives are here when we're planning and designing. So what we want is to have high quality homes and settlements with very low carbon emissions. Right now in the developing world, you might be able to say that you have a low carbon footprint, but a low quality of building that people live in. Here we have a higher quality of buildings and have progressive building codes, progressive building codes, uh, but we have the highest, one of the highest carbon footprints from our buildings in the world. So where, where are we trying to get to here? So Transform TO, that is the City of Toronto's Climate Change Action Plan. Uh, and it has some very, what you would think of as lofty goals. But really these lofty goals are our reality. So we want 100% of new buildings to be near or zero emissions by 2030. We want all of our existing buildings, that's from homes to tall buildings, uh, some of our you know, post-war towers, to be retrofit by 2050. And by at least a 40% improvement over where they are right now. We want 75% of our grid energy source to be from renewables, so low carbon sources. And in our city buildings, which is the right hand of that um, table, uh, we have higher aspirations. So by 2026, for example, we want all our new city buildings, so whether it's libraries, community centers, offices, to be at zero. So that means that right now, all of a sudden, uh, we're designing for zero emissions. The future weather, um, we had a study done in 2011 by Sennes Consulting, uh, and it projected that we would have uh, more intense rainfall events, um, more hot days over 30, longer periods of drought, for example, in the summer, um, and erratic types of weather. So where you get a freeze-thaw kind of system cycle uh, that you're seeing in the winter, that freezing and thawing takes quite a toll on our existing infrastructure, ro roads and pipes and things, which you've seen. Um, and this, this kind of weather proposed is the weather of today. It was actually proposed out to 2040, 2050, but these conditions are what we're seeing. So the cost of the 2013 flash flood, which had the Finch washout, was $1.08 billion in damages for, for the City of Toronto cleanup part. Just something to poke away at. Uh, and then these are some images from some of the storms that we've had. And so 2013 was a real landmark year for the City of Toronto as a government and a policymaker to realize that yes, we had to continue on our path of reducing CO2 emissions, but we also had to be planning for the future weather, which was really the weather of this decade. So we're not you know, exempt from extreme weather. We're not on sea level, so that, that's a good thing. Uh, but we do nevertheless have many um, issues and concerns. Uh, in the last year, you might have heard about some flooding where people were caught in an elevator in a tall building. Uh, we have a high aquifer, aquifer water table in the city of Toronto, and a lot of the tall buildings pump out the water from the parking floors and the basements to maintain that dry state. You know, we're not designing for ingress and egress in these buildings necessarily in the case of these events. Um, and one of the ways that we want to deal with that is through the use of green infrastructure. Um, Toronto launched its resilience strategy, and I think you heard from Amy Bootenhouse the other day. She's with our chief resilience office. Um, so we have this strategy, which is brand new. We have the new Transform TO strategy, a couple other that, uh, others that I'll mention. It's almost like a new wave. So in terms of working with the city, so many opportunities to either get involved as part of their engagement processes and help to shape how we meet these ambitious targets we have. But the area that I'm focused on implementing is about how infrastructure and buildings can be made to be more resilient. And when I say that, I do mean the two parts, the two sides of the coin of climate change. So some ways we do that as planners, you can influence at the larger scale, large area plans that go on. They're also called secondary plans. And this is just an example of the downtown core uh, plan and some of the policies that were in there. 
So we place the policy framework in there. So it, if you work in policy, if that's the direction you go, this is the kind of thing you'd be working on is the research background towards justifying put these, putting these policies in place that then will define the way that that area is revitalized or grows and changes. So in the downtown core, it's a very built up area, obviously. It's where we have the greatest density and agglomeration of tall buildings, not a lot of green space, so not a lot of sponge or ways to uh, reduce the impacts of extreme rain, for example. Lots of traffic congestion, increased um, air quality problems and particulates because they're concentrated among those buildings. But then, yeah, this great opportunity for community scale energy sharing and using low carbon systems. In this case, they're looking at expanding the unwage, unwage system. So when we're talking about green infrastructure a little bit, um, and I think you might be spending some time in a workshop on this, but it's the idea that you're trying to use the natural systems and processes, but creating those, so they're human made, things like bioswales, green streets, um, stormwater ponds, which is a similar kind of thing, um, to hold water and retain it on site, but yet providing the advantages of and the co-benefits of biodiversity habitats, you know, those kinds of important things. But they're reducing that peak flow from the intense rainfall. And one of the big things we've done there in the City of Toronto is through the creation of the Green Roof by Bylaw. So that is the one of the first bylaws um, in North America to require green roofs on um, most buildings it applies to. Uh, so it has a higher requirement depending on the size of the building. And um, we have 620 green roofs built, uh, 500,000 square meters. I've, I've heard it's actually more than that of green roof now. So that's, we have about 100 CFL football field size of green roof, either in construction or built together. And so if you think about as a planner, what lots look like, so planning and proposals that are coming through, um, they generally have a large building footprint on a relatively small site. So in that case, where are you putting the greenery? So you need to use that roof for storage and biodiversity and habitat creation. And so that's what's behind the green roof bylaw. But at the same time, it's also sequestering carbon. So within that green system, and then we have an incentive program that goes along with that. So if somebody can't provide the green roof, the dollars from that that they have to pay, it's called cash in lieu, goes into a fund and it covers other green roofs where they weren't required by the bylaw, for example, on existing buildings, but where you have a real interest from landowners to put a green roof on the roof. So that's kind of an interesting kind of um, carrot and stick approach too. So some other resilience planning tools we have are through our ravine strategy. So we're trying to manage those ravines. We have to keep them healthy uh, or we're, we're not gonna have the benefit of those systems in buffering those intense rainfalls, for example. And what you're gonna see from the intense rainfall is much more erosion, sedimentation of the water courses, uh, changing of the pattern of the water courses, things like that. So we have to protect them. And we also have a new biodiversity strategy too. And I just mentioned the Portland's Flood Protection Project because it's a good example where it brings together um, the ideas of climate resilient infrastructure. So uh, down at the mouth of the Don, it's using a lot of green infrastructure in combination with the hard infrastructure requirements we have um, and elevated to um, at least what we call the regional storm level. And then it, it provides for then the ability to develop some of the lands around there. Now something you'd be interested in, so the stats on the green workforce, that we have over 30,000 people employed in the green workforce, and about 18% of those are in the green buildings and infrastructure section. Now I would say that that's probably a lot, that's low, and it's probably much higher than that, and the city's just about to try to um, quantify what it really is right now, because even in my work, and we'll be talking about that a bit in a minute, um, there's a huge world of consultants that work on green buildings and infrastructure and design. So I would say that it is quite a lucrative um, sector. So the thing that I oversee at the, green, at the City of Toronto is called the Toronto Green Standard. And it is our set of performance measures for new construction. So it applies to all new development that comes through. And it's our way of um, setting out all our environmental policies, but in a quantitative way in terms of what we expect on capability, sustainable design, and construction. 
and it has four key areas that it applies to. So we're trying to improve air quality, we're trying to reduce GHG emissions, add higher energy efficiency to buildings, um, increase um, water balance or improve water balance quality and efficiency, enhance the urban ecology, which is a big, really big part of the green standard, and reduce solid waste to landfill. And so tier one is our minimum level of performance. So um, it includes a lot of things that are matters of exterior sustainable design, we call them, because those are the authorities that we have under the Planning Act to govern those kind of things. So the way you design the site in terms of its landscaping, its stormwater retention, reducing urban heat island effect through the use of high albedo materials, um, anything that's on the, the, the grade portion of the site, the, the walls and the roof are the things that are matters of exterior sustainable design. Now, we don't have great authorities in Ontario to ask for energy efficiency above the Ontario Building Code. So some cities, they have the abilities to make their own building code and Toronto does not. Um, but nevertheless, we ask for higher energy efficiency because we have these big climate change policies and objectives. We really have to keep moving the bar forward. So we found a way to do that. So that's also a part of the tier one. The tier two level. So it's actually a tiered system up to tier four now. Um, and tier four is a zero emissions level of a building. But in tier two, you see higher performance levels, but also inside of the building. Now, if you think of the LEED system, which you might know about, what this represents, the TGS, is Toronto's set of prerequisites. So these are the things that every builder has to meet uh, before they get their planning approvals and before they even proceed to building permit on environmental performance. And together, they try to address carbon and resilience as central and many other objectives too. So what we do here is if a building is certified to tier two, we offer a development charges refund so development charges are the monies that a builder has to pay that help support the building of, of infrastructure. So sanitary, sewer, water, daycares, libraries, those things. And um, what we believe is that, and what we've shown through studies too, is that when you build highly efficient buildings in site, you're reducing the pressure on infrastructure and the need to expand it. So that avoided infrastructure cost is of value to the city, to the city government, right? So we give some of that money back and it's quite a substantial refund. There's, there's nothing like it in North America um, to get these buildings um, certified to tier two or better. And that is what has pulled along the market because all those buildings and sites that are at least tier two level, they showcase then that this is doable. It is possible to meet these higher levels of performance. And then we can quickly roll that tier two into tier one in the next update cycle. So these are just some of the statistics that we have around it. Um, so we have 35 um, certified projects, but about 100 coming through that are tier two or better. And these are quite high performance. So on the energy side, they're at least 25% better than the code in terms of how the buildings are designed with high levels of water efficiency um, and lots of other great features. So in my role as a, a planner, I work a lot with the building industry and I work a lot with sustainability consultants too. And those are really our partners and how we implement these things. Now, back to climate change. So climate change is really about how we make and use energy. You know, and how, we, how can we change that quickly in a way that's not impacting and produces the high quality that we're talking about, we're intending for. So for us, um, this is something that we've been working on too, um, and it's been developed and adopted by council now in 2017. It's called the Zero Emissions Building Framework. Um, we're trying to reduce energy in buildings, we're trying to reduce carbon, we're trying to add resilience, we're trying to add those three prongs to everything that we do uh, and that we think about and study. So the zero emissions building framework is about setting higher performance targets out to where we need to get to as part of that overall transform geo climate change plan, uh, but just for the building sector, along with what are those other requirements that you need to have to go with that to make sure that it actually happens and gets implemented. Um, and we know that we'll save at least 30.6 megatons of CO2 by 2050 by implementing the zero emissions building framework. And where it comes from is the idea that while our codes have been improving and improving over time, so the energy performance has improved in the Ontario Building Code and lots of the reference standards, so the National Energy Code, uh, ASHRAE, things like that. 
But what we're seeing in the data, though, is not a great correlation between the design two under those codes and how those buildings are actually operating and performing. And that really matters at a time when you're trying to find ways to reduce carbon. Because every time that building's built, that carbon that it holds and the energy that it uses um, is locked in for at least 50 to 100 years. We can't do much about it. Um, and one of the big areas where it's kind of low-hanging fruit that we realize that we can address now, because we've really improved on the efficiency of mechanical systems for heating, ventilation, and cooling in buildings over time, but is on thermal performance. Does everybody know what thermal performance is? This is what it has to do with. So thermal bridging is the idea that you have extensive air leakage and heat loss coming from our building, and it creates like a highway out of the building. Seems kind of obvious, right? So this is a building being tested at night, air tightness tested, which is when you, you close off zones of the building, you pressurize it, and you see what amount of air leakage you have in the dark. And you can see that these buildings are leaking a lot of heat and energy. Well, why is that? It's because the building envelopes aren't constructed, con constructed with a high degree of thermal performance, which seems kind of like a no-brainer, right? So this is some of the national data that we have on uh, building performance. And what we're looking at here is the energy use intensity. This is Enercan data. So if you look at a building before 1920, it's on the left-hand side, or a building at 2010 or later constructed and operating, what's the trend? Can you say that louder? Yeah, and we would have expected that you would see a decline in the total energy use intensity, kilowatt hours per meter squared of floor area over time because the codes are getting better and better and better, aren't they? So there's a performance gap, and it's important when you're designing building standards and policies around building performance to note this because it doesn't matter uh, how much we as a city keep increasing the numbers on what, how buildings should perform if we can't figure out how to reduce the gap that happens between how a building designed and how it actually operates afterward. So the TGS is our implementation mechanism for the zero emissions building framework target. So we have targets for five large building types. Um, so that's all this is showing you, the five large building types and it's showing you the energy use intensity target is the lighter blue, and the, the red dots are a greenhouse gas target for these buildings. And then the lower part is something we're gonna talk about a little bit called the TEDI. And um, the idea is that these targets come down substantially to zero emissions by 2030, so anything in design would be at zero or better. And what we've done here too is worked with the building industry to establish these energy targets. And this is without a code to do so in Toronto. And we've had great support from the green building industry because we've worked with them for so long. Uh, so in supporting these targets, but we've published the targets out to 2030. So they also know where they're gonna have to be in four years, every four years, we're gonna take away a tier one, a step. Now this is the same kind of system that exists within the BC building code, step code and also the city of Vancouver has a similar system as well. So we're trying to match up the way that we require energy performance and carbon reduction in buildings uh, from east to west. Now tier four is at a passive house level. So if that resonates with you, if you know what passive house is, so very high performing buildings with low energy needs. Now, a couple things back to resilience for a minute to think about, so a couple of concepts. So the idea of passive survivability is about how do you, again, that safe to fail idea, how do you maintain critical life support functions and conditions for occupants during extended power outages, and what are they? So in a tall building, for example, we have a lot of those in Toronto, when you have a power outage, most of the EMS calls that we get are above the sixth floor. So it's people calling and panicking. I can't get out of my building. My unit is getting too hot. You know, what else might they be thinking, right? So they need the critical systems. They need to be able to flush their toilet. They need to be able to get water. 
during those circumstances, and we have had a few of these kinds of power outages in the last 10 years. The thermal resilient side, um, a concept to keep in mind, is this idea of, again, when the power's out, what is the livable unit temperature? Is it livable, first of all, uh, without power? Um, because you want people to be able to shelter in place. So the idea here is that a high performance, low emissions building, uh, they maintain a livable indoor temperature without power, allowing people to shelter in place. So that reduces the pressure on our EMS systems at the City of Toronto, but also it's for the idea of also life and safety, of course. So that's a resilience concept that we want to include into codes and standards. So and it really comes from just asking the question. So here, uh, we did some modeling when we were doing modeling out our, what our building's performance target should be. We also looked at this issue under a model. So if you turn the power off in these different building archetypes we were looking at, what was the indoor temperature during winter without power? So after two weeks. So if you look here, this is a high-rise multi-unit residential building being modeled. And tier one, that's um, just above yeah, just above the Ontario building code there. So tier four is the zero emissions passive house level building. And you see that it's holding its indoor unit temperature by model at a nice comfy 18 degrees C. And similarly with a, a low rise building, you see a similar trend. It's not as, um, uh, as extreme or as beneficial, but it's still there in terms of um, more comfortable indoor condition. So we, we looked at all different energy codes around the globe. So this is the kind of work that we're doing um, in our unit to, to say, how could we improve the codes and standards that we have here? Uh, and we borrowed the best elements from those standards. And, so, and one of them is Passive House. Another is Minergy, which is a Swiss standard. Uh, and you see some others listed there too. California Title 24 is one. And we looked at the ways that we measure energy performance in carbon now in codes. And we wanted to keep some of those elements, but improve some of the others. And so we actually changed the performance metrics to something called thermal energy demand intensity, which is heating demand. What's the heating demand in the building? Um, what the total energy use would be, and then adding a greenhouse gas intensity cap. And when you ask for a thermal energy demand, which is a space heating demand target within your energy performance requirement, which normally isn't there, it causes designers and builders to have to think about passive design. What can they do with the building envelope to try to address and reduce their energy and carbon? Which is something that we always used to do, like passive design principles in buildings has always been there, but it's been kind of lost and forgotten along the way. It causes a rethink of the energy balance in the building. What are the heat losses? What are the heat gains? How can I mitigate that? I've got to meet these caps. And every four years, they're going to increase. CO2 emissions, they have to actually calculate out by the fuel source and by the size of the building. What's the emissions on this building? And if they don't meet the cap target that we have, what are they going to think about? They're going to think about what other fuel source can I use? How can I fuel switch to a renewable low carbon source? When we looked at the capital cost premium, and this is also part of our work in planning, so we always cost everything out before we can go to city council with it. What we actually found was that the total, the, the capital cost premium, which is the increase in the cost as a total portion of construction cost, peaked at tier three, but overall it only maxed out at about six and a half percent of total construction costs. And then it came down again at tier four. So at the passive house level, very insulative, uh, you know, well-performing, very comfortable buildings, comfortable without power, the cost premium came down a bit. And that's because you're not relying as much on the active mechanical systems. In that case, you're relying more on the things that last longer, have a longer building life cycle, 50 to 100 years, which are in that, you know, construction component of the walls and the roof itself. And those parts of the building also have the most embodied energy and carbon in terms of where, where the material comes from, how it's processed and produced. So these targets force um, a change in the way we design buildings. And back to the way we really thought about it probably in the 1960s and 70s, 
focusing on passive design principles. But we want to be thinking about orientation and form and the ways that buildings use energy. Um, we want to have less, more wall, less window. Um, and we want to make sure that we reduce things that cause thermal bridging, what I was talking to you about before. And balconies are one of the key causes of that. But there's other ways to construct balconies so that they don't conduct heat. And using the best windows. Well, this is what we see a lot of in Toronto. And these are very leaky buildings. It's what we call window wall construction. It goes up really quickly, but there's not a lot of attention to thermal bridging and breaks where the windows connect and so on. There's a lot of detail to const actually constructing the building that's gonna be required, and it's gonna build a big construction trades industry around higher quality construction to meet the codes and standards. So what we're gonna see over time, we think, and we're already starting to see it, is you're gonna see more wall. <laughs> you're gonna see higher performance windows even to triple glazing, and some of those products aren't even in the marketplace yet. So the, the targets and standards themselves create a market demand. And it's a really important role of regulation to do that. If the bar is set in the right place and on the things where we really have objectives, um, we're gonna see lower carbon materials in new construction systems. We're gonna see an attention to what we call thermal bridging, which sounds boring, but it's a big deal in terms of heat loss, energy loss. And we're gonna see increased insulative capacity on these buildings. And we're gonna see the integration of renewables on buildings and hopefully better price points to those things. So right now we see a lot of geo exchange being used, but you can't see it visually because it's drilled underneath and the mechanicals are in the basement. But that's a cleaner source because it's using electricity. But we hope to see more, more solar PV. And then a real more, a greater focus on testing and measurement. So for example, that air tightness testing that we talked about. So we've introduced a new air tightness testing requirement uh, for large buildings in Toronto for the first time. So all that to say that we're moving towards high performance architecture. And there are lots of great examples that are coming up in Toronto now. So this is the, the Mohawk Center in Hamilton and also a deep retrofit example in Hamil Hamilton too that's being done to passive house standards. Uh, and then the Mount Dennis Child Care Center is the city's first of its, its own building that is net zero energy. So supplying as much renewable low carbon energy as it uses. And some other examples are um, the University of Toronto Scarborough campus is gonna be building a passive house level, so tier four level student residence building with a nice green roof, very insulative and efficient. And the Arbor, uh, another student residence building on the waterfront, which will also be wood frame construction, is aiming for tier four too. So these things are already coming through and in part it's to do with how regulation, which is part of the role of planners to set, triggers those things. It creates a demand and it usually happens in the institutional sector first. And then we also see it in the rental sector where the owner is actually getting the benefit of those standards through owning the building and getting the cost payback, so the savings on energy use, for example, over the life of the building. So what's your resilience checklist? So you're moving into the fields of work soon as a planner. How are you gonna be thinking out 50 to 100 years on any of the work you're doing, whether it's policy development, standards development, whether you're working physically on development applications and approvals? How are you gonna ensure that we're thinking long-term and about the capability of infrastructure and systems? that are being designed? What questions are you gonna to pose to the design team, the developer, to make sure that we're building low carbon, resilient buildings and infrastructure? So these are the, some of the things that we're working on. We have lots more to do. And that's all I have for you this morning. So I'll take any questions. Get to you in just a minute. Just a minute. Just, um, I, I just wanted to. Um, actually, we should probably move to the center here because if not, the camera won't catch us. Just wanted to uh, welcome some other people that are with us today. Uh, Jennifer Hayward, who teaches part time at Seneca in the urban planning and watershed management area. 
Uh, she is full-time with Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority. Thanks for coming out, Jennifer. And Alex Jensezavik, who is uh, with the Resilience 2 to 1 website um, and does a lot of work on Canada's uh, bio capacity to its eco-carbon footprint, which is around a ratio of 2 to 1. So um, let us open the floor to questions, and we have one right down here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how does this plan work hand in hand with developing affordable housing and keeping our our uh, housing prices low? Like that's obviously a critical issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a constant tension for sure. Well, so starting back again, we have to have an objective. So what is our objective? So it is to have affordable housing that's really high quality, where people aren't put at risk. And right now what you have is in affordable housing across the Toronto, they were probably most at risk when you have power outages or extreme events and disruptions, for example. And one of the interesting things that's happening is one of the leaders that I should have mentioned at the end is Toronto Community Housing, who is going to be building um, a large block of tier four level passive house, uh, new buildings for that will be affordable housing. And for them, it is figuring out that business proposition. Now, if they own the land in the buildings, again, much easier, right? Because what they're going to see is after they design and construct those buildings, the operating costs on energy anyway are going to come right down, substantially down, like a two-thirds reduced. So in terms of affordability, there's that proposition for whoever the housing owner is. So if it's a personal homeowner too, that's the benefit to them is that they have very low energy costs living in a high performance building. Now the transition to getting there and showing those buildings and the experience of living in them is where we're at right now, those kind of tensions. But um, I think that's what we're gonna see and I think the general opinion of those that write these kind of codes like in BC and Ontario is that everybody should have the right to live in a high performance building. That should be the minimum standard for everyone. Why are we living in you know, leaky, underperforming, carbon-emitting buildings, right? Surely our experts over here have some questions to ask. Jennifer. Um, what about the oh, oh, hold on a minute. We'll, we'll bring the mic to you. Sorry. Uh, one of the items in your presentation that stuck out to me was the passive survivability concept. Um, probably coming from the CA world. Uh, and I just wanted to know what your thought was on the role that conservation authorities could play in passive survivability under their CA Act and the corresponding Ontario regulations um, to support cities and municipalities, as well as sort of how that might be challenged given the current um, Ford government in the political climate that that's created. Well, I, I think that CA's play so many important roles, but certainly it has been focused more on the idea of the green infrastructure in the past, right, and the flood prevention. I mean, if it wasn't for CAs, you would have all sorts of development in the floodplain now, and we would have had far more damages from any intense rainfall events we've had. Uh, and Ontario is one of the only jurisdictions that has CAs and has that benefit. So if you compare Ontario to, for example, what happened to Calgary, a uh, number of years ago in terms of that flooding. That was in part due to the fact that they allow development in floodplain areas. So CAs play a really important role, but one of the changes under, you know, the, when you add the climate change future weather lens is what area is flood prone? It's asking that question. So it's not just the riverine floodplains anymore. It's what we call um, pluvial flooding or, you know, flooding that pockets in different parts of the landform landscape anywhere. You know, you see the big problem with basement flooding. So I, I think that um, CAs being a big role they could play is in helping to understand better and define where those areas of risk are as well as protecting the riverine systems and helping to develop those preventative and then active programs to help existing landowners that are in those areas. So I think that's a really big role. In terms of passive survivability, I'm not sure if that's passive or more active, <laughs> but passive is, we think of it more as the critical systems that are operating inside a building. So indirectly, I think the CA's work Im Im impacts that. Hi, 
Hi, Lisa. Glenn Millet from, uh, with the Canadian Urban Institute. A great presentation. I really enjoyed some of the, 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 the gory detail that you were, were, were talking about, and there's clearly much more that we could be talking about. Um, so, I, you, I, sir, you I'm enjoy gory I, detail? I'm, interest, <laughs> I'm interested Check. in knowing if uh, you're considering energy from waste as a, as, a, a, as a solution, which is something that Sweden has been very successful with. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the city itself has a very aggressive waste management strategy that has recently come out, and it has quite a big focus on the idea of the circular economy, um, but circular systems in general, so that idea of energy from waste would be part of that. I mean, the city itself has piloted different energy from waste systems, um, but as far as that becoming sort of a mainstream part of uh, power sources, fuel sources. Um, I'm probably not the best one to comment on that, but I'm sure it would be, we would be looking at all those possibilities in terms of re meeting, meeting that, you know, renewable energy target, for example, that we have. Could, Glenn, could you just speak to the energy from waste uh, approach, what, what that is all about? Oh, okay, um, this is called being put on the spot. So it, oh. in, uh, in Sweden, one of the, one of the great uh, lessons that we learned on study tours that we've taken uh, to Sweden is that they've been able to, as a country, move their, their um, performance level, their economy forward uh, with, uh, and achieve environmental gains. Uh, and uh, reducing their dependence on, on carbon sources. And one of the ways they've been able to do that is combining district energy uh, plans uh, mm -hmm. with energy from waste, where they're, um, uh, w which is ultimately a, a renewable uh, resource because you're always going to be creating um, more waste. And so it's very effective and uh, supported by groups like Greenpeace and uh, it is, is mm -hmm. something that we have a difficult time uh, culturally mm -hmm. uh, um, get, getting our heads around in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Glenn. That was great. Um, other questions, observations, comments? Um, Peter, please. Okay, so as the business person here, um, I saw an ad a, a couple of months ago for a condo up in Markham that was advertising they have the lowest condo fees because they are a smart design build. How do we get uh, builders today to mm -hmm. think more like that as a sales feature? Because, uh, you know, when, when especially for the people here who are going to be likely buying condos for their first homes and things, they don't realize that they have to spend five or $600 a month on maintenance fees and then, you know, another five or $600 a month in uh, taxes. But if they can reduce at least the condo fees for the maintenance and energy needs down to zero, wouldn't you pay just a little bit more? And then that gets to the next level, and we've got bankers in the room. We're sorry, they're insurance people, but they're part of a bank. Um, how do we get the banks to you know, give people better mortgage rates or a, a larger mortgage because they know that their monthly payment's going to drop if they happen to live in a condominium that doesn't have to pay big fees for the heating, ventilating, air conditioning system? Okay, so I mean, two great questions. Um, on the first one, uh, one of the areas of marketing potential that I, I think is, you know, really comes from high performance buildings is just the idea of how comfortable uh, the units will be that, you know, people would care about, but they kind of have to experience these units first in order to have that impression. And that includes the condo developers themselves. I think there's a real lack of awareness there about what the potential is. And one of the, the ideas there too is, you know, in Toronto you have increasingly smaller units, not in all cases, but for example, in the very dense parts of the city. And so what is the opportunity there to have greater um, floor area available because all parts of the unit are comfortable, even those most closely located next to the window. So oftentimes when I'm explaining the teddy metric, I'll actually explain it as, you know, likened to a teddy bear where you have these really comfortable um, indoor environments and you can cozy up to the window or the wall without drafts. That's something that we don't really think about too much. Um, also the resilience aspect too, um, that's something that developers did show an interest in when we were consulting, but it's not something that they would normally or want to advertise quite yet to the public because it also suggests a degree of risk perhaps. But I think, I think you know, over time being able to advertise that, that idea of that thermal performance will be, in one way or another, in simple terms, will be a real advantage for the development community. And I think the CMHC is, is really on to the idea of, um, you know, your second question in, in terms of what, 
how we change sort of mortgage rates and things like that. Um, but I think it's yet to come, all of that, that work. Thank you, Lisa. And, and were there any further comments, questions, observations? Okay, I'm going to ask Andrew uh, Wickham um, just to say a few words about just the process that we're undergoing in, in the room, uh, some of the initiatives that, that he's taken uh, as part of this event, and, and some of our means of thanking you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Andrew, You're welcome. take it away. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. Uh, it was a great presentation. So we just have a small gift package thank here you. with some of our Seneca honey, a few tasty treats. And then as another kind of thank you, uh, we work towards uh, funding a couple initiatives around the world for wind farms, forest planting, biomass power, clean water, solar power, and solar cooking uh, to offset about 24 tons of CO2 for the event to try and lower mm. impact as much as possible and help communities around the world. So thank you very much Fabulous. for being a part of that. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thanks, Phil. Thank Andrew, <laughs> could you just speak quickly to... Um, the materials that are part of, uh, of yeah. the food stops here today. So uh, there are signs already up, but um, so that everybody knows, um, everything here is uh, to be thrown in the compost. So there's no actual garbage. Um, I don't even think there's any recycling. Everything goes right into the compost. So including cutlery, whatever it is. All right. Well, anyways, enjoy the rest. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. So don't worry. The um, your coffee cup won't uh, decombust uh, in your hands as they, they last a considerable period of time beyond, but they will be ultimately compostable. So um, we're, we're drawing to a close of the first part of the morning session. Um, we're going to be introducing some folks from TD Insurance in the second part of the program. Uh, we're going to be undertaking an exercise that you'll all have an opportunity to participate in in a kind of a workshop format. So I'm going to suggest now that we take a bit of a break and resume around 10.30. So have, a, have some coffee in those compostable uh, cups. <laughs>